Welcome to this webinar on optical systems, which is in two parts. In this first part, we will concentrate on the main fiber technologies used today in cable telecom networks, including hybrid fiber coax, HFC, and RF over glass, RFOG. Optical fiber is superior in its ability to deliver limitless bandwidth and once in place could be sufficient for hundreds of years. This makes fiber the best choice for greenfield applications, but also a huge consideration in many brownfield situations where current technologies are approaching bandwidth limitations. The advantages include no power requirement between the central office and the end user, virtually limitless bandwidth potential only capped by architecture chosen, and that architecture's ability to migrate to newer optical technologies, optimal flexibility, high reliability, easy migration path for equipment and technology upgrades, and longer network life. The disadvantages, though, are higher costs associated with brownfield deployment, longer rollout times, expensive labor costs, slower returns on investment, and challenges with reaching scattered or rural populations. The optical spectrum includes frequencies spanning 10 to the 12th to 10 to the 17th hertz. Fiber optics extends the realm of communications to a subset of those frequencies from 1.6 times 10 to the 14th hertz to 3.5 times 10 to the 14th hertz, the region just below visible light. This optical spectrum is usually discussed in terms of wavelengths, though, not frequency. Wavelength is a measure of the distance between consecutive cycles of a repeating waveform, while frequency indicates the number of times per unit of time that a signal repeats itself. For electromagnetic waves in free space, the two are linked by this simple relationship to the speed of light. Wavelength times frequency equals the speed of light in free space. Or put another way, wavelength equals the speed of light divided by the frequency of the waveform. Similar to RF, optical frequencies alone do not carry any information. They must be modulated by other information first in either analog or digital form to become carriers. Cable telecom operators have aggressively pursued using the transmission of optical frequencies over fiber optics to increase system bandwidth and reliability. The first application was for super trunking between head ends and hubs, where fiber trunks eliminated the need for failure-prone electronic amplifiers. As improved fiber manufacturing technology decreased fiber attenuation, the benefits of lower cost fiber and signal distribution over greater distances without amplifier cascades drove the replacement of coax with fiber further into the network. The result was a hybrid fiber coax or HFC architecture where signals are transported optically from the head end to fiber nodes that typically serve 250 to 1000 subscribers each. Here are the four major components of the HFC cable system. The head end, fiber optic system, coaxial distribution system, and customer premises. Fiber optic cables are used to link the head end to the service area as the signal delivered at the node is unamplified and therefore superior to a coaxial cable which requires multiple amplifiers to cover the same distance. From the node though, the signals are distributed over coaxial cables as these distances are typically shorter, not usually requiring amplification. The drawback with amplification is that each time a signal is passed through a cable amplifier, not only is the video signal amplified, but also the noise from the amplifier is as well, which means that after multiple amplifications, the signal becomes unusable. As the benefits of fiber in telephony developed, new applications, particularly telephony, introduced fiber rings into cable plants for connection to the PSTN. These rings were based upon the Synchronous Optical Network, or SONET, standard, which dominated telephony fiber connectivity due to its reliability and operation system support. Over time, cable operators adopted SONET and other ring architectures for their own regional fiber head end interconnects, and some operators constructed their own national fiber backbone networks to interconnect regional fiber rings. Distribution and drop remains the last area to be converted to fiber. 
Some versions of passive optical networking or PON technology are removing the need for expensive amplifiers and regenerators, making fiber an economically viable medium for business data access and new residential access plant. However, the chief disadvantage of PON in a cable system is that the PON head-end network elements, back office support, and customer premises equipment are different from and incompatible with the DOCSIS-based system developed for cable's HFC architecture. For this reason, the cable industry developed new standards for RF over glass, or RFOG which leverage existing HFC investment while providing a path to fiber to the subscriber. An RFOG architecture builds upon the HFC infrastructure and thus allows existing areas served by HFC to continue with that architecture, while new construction extends fiber beyond the node to the customer's premises. This changes the economics of fiber access from complete system rebuild to growth and additions. In an RFOG architecture, a single fiber supports both the forward and return path. Using WDM, Wavelength Division Multiplexing, downstream signals are transported over 1550 nanometer wavelengths and upstream signals use 1310 nanometers. The optical path can be a node design or a head-end feed design. In the head-end feed design shown here, the downstream video and CMTS cable modem termination system feeds are input to a 1550 laser transmitter and the output is fed into the EDFA, erbium doped fiber amplifier for amplification prior to entering the optical WDM module. The WDM module provides the combination and separation of the 1550 nanometer downstream and 1310 nanometer upstream signals. Instead of entering a node in the field, the signal is fed directly into a tap where a portion of the optical energy is output on the drop fibers and the remainder continues on to the next tap. At the Subscriber Network Interface Unit, or NIU, the downstream optical signal is converted to the RF spectrum and distributed just as in traditional HFC systems. In the upstream, the NIU converts RF input from subscriber equipment to the 1310 nanometer optical spectrum and transmits back to the head end, where it is fed into the analog receiver and converted back to the RF spectrum. Up to 32 subscribers can be served by a head-end feed architecture depending upon the distance to the subscribers and the optical budget. This diagram illustrates a node-based architecture. The architecture and signal flow is similar to head-end feed, except for the addition of a 1 to 8 split and amplification stage at a node feeding 8 fibers to the taps. In this architecture, the node can be placed as far as 40 kilometers from the head end, and each individual output fiber from the node can feed up to 32 homes via the taps, serving a total area of 256 homes per node. Another way to view RFOG is that the downstream optical receiver and the upstream optical transmitter of a typical HFC node have been compressed into a small module which can be placed on the side of the subscriber's home. This means that the same signals going to and from the HFC node now are converted to RF at the subscriber's home and then are routed through the home in the same manner as with HFC. So from the RF ground block to the modem or set-top box STB, the signal will run over the existing coaxial cable. To do this in an existing HFC plant, we can free up fibers going to the node by combining the downstream and upstream wavelengths on one fiber for the HFC node by using a wave division multiplexer WDM. We'll do the same for the RFOG signal on the freed up fiber and migrate the node components to the side of the house. So far, this is sufficient to describe an RFOG solution. However, it would require one fiber to leave the head end and travel directly to a subscriber. This is an inefficient use of the fiber, so the standard permits splitting the fiber to serve a number of homes in the fiber's path. The process of splitting the fiber to 32 or up to 64 homes adds 3 to 4 dB of insertion loss for each 1 to 2 split. By the time the signal is split 32 ways, we've added 17 to 18 dB of insertion loss and for 64 ways, 20 to 21 dB. 
To overcome the splitting losses on the downstream, an optical amplifier or erbium-doped fiber amplifier is added at the head end or hub. These devices most economically operate around 1550 nanometers for the downstream wavelength. The splitting mentioned before can be done a number of ways. The centralized cabinet with a collection of 1 to 32 splitters is what most people recognize as the key component to a PON or passive optical network which will be discussed later. The passive splitting can also be done by taking the collection of 1 to 2 splitters that are cascaded to create the 1 to 32 matrix and rearranging them in other ways, for example as a 1 to 4 with each leg feeding a 1 to 8. When these devices are housed in separate splice cases or an access point, the architecture is called distributed split. A variation to this is to use distributed taps, which are cascades of optical couplers in splice cases, with the down leg of the coupler feeding splitters in the same splice case to accommodate two, four, or eight subscribers at each location. Each of the distributed methods reduces the fiber count in the cable by as much as eight times, in comparison to centralized splitting. This benefit is significant when building RFOG in rural areas. Since the passive access points have no active devices, maintenance is minimal to non-existent. A major objective of the SCTE, Society of Cable Telecommunications Engineers Working Group that prepared the RFOG standard, was to assure that the RFOG solution would not prohibit operating a PON system on the same fiber. The term PON for passive optical network is not used in association with RFOG networks, even though the fiber plant and splitting approach can be the same. The term PON also implies the modulation or transport protocols associated with APON, VPON, or GPON networks which transport telecommunication signals such as ATM, TDM, IP, and so on, or with EPON which transports only Ethernet protocols or IP through the passive network. These protocols are different from and not compatible with the frequency division multiplexing or FDM approach used in HFC networks for video or DOCSIS data transport. It was well understood that the modulation scheme of PONS would conflict with the FDM scheme of HFC and DOCSIS and RFOG networks if placed on the same wavelength in a fiber plant. The cleanest way to do this is to avoid wavelength overlaps with the equipment. PONs have traditionally used 1490 nanometers as the downstream wavelength and 1310 nanometers as the upstream. Cable operators have traditionally used two fibers to feed an HFC node, using 1550 or 1310 nanometers in their plant, and either one could be upstream or downstream. The original FTTH networks built for operators using the RFOG architectures used 1550 downstream and 1310 upstream, but the benefit of 1550 is the low insertion loss in fiber and the ability to amplify. R-ONU transmitters using 1310 are the least expensive configuration and are still permitted by the standard. However, it must be understood by anyone building an RFOG network with 1310 nanometer return that a PON cannot operate on the same network. The resolved wavelengths for RFOG networks to be compatible with PON networks are 1550 nanometers downstream and 1610 nanometers upstream. The Standard Committee also had to consider that the IEEE advocates the use of different wavelengths for the 10 gig EPON networks coming to the market. These networks will use 1577 nanometers downstream and 1270 nanometers upstream. The chosen wavelengths for RFOG networks due to their proximity to other wavelengths possible on the same fiber will require high quality filtering in the devices. Improvements in glass fiber manufacturing and optical standards have expanded the possibilities for cable system service offerings. Putting everything together, it has become possible to create hybrid architectures within a single network topology that simultaneously serves residential and business needs for voice, data, and video services. In the example shown here, business services overlay fibers run parallel with a separate fiber serving an RFOG architecture. 
High-capacity data services using PON are provided to businesses over 1,270, 1,577, and 1,590 nanometer wavelengths using CWDM in the overlay fibers. A separate single fiber serves PON-based data services and RF services with business data services provided over 1,310 and 1,550 nanometers using PON and RF services offered over RFOG using 1,310 nanometers forward and a new 1,610 nanometer RFOG return wavelength proposed by the SCTE Standards Committee. PON and RFOG coexistence become possible by shifting the RFOG return wavelength to 1610 nanometers per the new SCTE standard and adding wavelength filtering at the subscriber network interface unit to pull off the video and pass the PON wavelengths. That completes part one. Please continue on to part two. Thank you.